Rather than try to make an intro segment where I go over some elements of the game and then attempt to segue into today's challenge, I will just tell to y'all straight. I just really wanted to play Oblivion this week and figured I could make a video out of it as well. Plus, it has been a hot minute since I made my last video on the game. Regardless, for the sake of consistency, I will now ask the question, can you beat Oblivion with only your fists? The answer? Yeah, more than likely. But as I said, I was playing the game anyway, may as well make a video out of it. Also, I am leaving the difficulty slider where it starts, as pushing in either direction either results in everything becoming a damage sponge, or the game playing itself for you. With all that out of the way, let's begin. I was initially going to make a character that looked like Senator Armstrong to fill the Metal Gear quota for this video, but after cycling through different degrees of smashed tomatoes, I opted to shelve that idea and just picked a Khajiit instead. Unlike Skyrim, where playing as a Khajiit gives you a flat damage bonus to your unarmed attacks, in Oblivion, playing as one of the bipedal cats just has you start with an extra 10 points in hand to hand, as it's an actual skill in this game. Sure, it has an advantage over the other races, but not really mandatory if you want to punch everyone into an early grave. Hell, picking an orc may have been the better choice due to their berserk racial power. Regardless, I stick with the kitten and managed to come up with a character I'm proud of. This is... it's green. Checking my skills and seeing what I have to work with, and for now I have a hand-to-hand -hand skill of 15, meaning I do a whopping 1 damage with each punch. While this isn't ideal, after I get to meet my class, this will go up substantially. I hope. After getting berated by the most racist elf around, I get to meeting Professor X and his bodyguards before just being allowed to walk out of my cell via the secret exit. Here's hoping we aren't a mass murderer, otherwise the Emperor has made one of the biggest mistakes of his life. Hurrying ahead, I managed to actually get some wise words from one of the assassins. I might swim more if it weren't for the slaughterfish, sharp teeth, and some carry disease. After that insightful information, I begin to beat the man to a pulp. It's actually a good way to find out how effective punching can be. A bonus to using your fist is that you'll never recoil if you hit an opponent's block, so therefore, in most scenarios, I can just move out of the way and keep up the offensive, only having to back away if I see a big attack coming. The rats, zombies, and goblins hiding in the prison's walls are of little concern. Granted, this is still the tutorial, so I'm not expecting to get bodied while I'm here. To make sure I continue to only bloody my knuckles and nothing else, I also go against my better judgement and don't crush the goblins with a nearby log trap, which is a usual must for any new Oblivion adventure. With a few more goblins denied their life, I met back up with Picard and the crew before choosing my birthday. Nothing too exciting here, I just go with the warrior for the extra 10 points in both strength and endurance, as extra damage and health are always good to have. From here, things play out as normal. More punching, more dying, and the Mythic Dawn getting away with their little assassination attempt. That said, the man they picked for the job seemed to have second thoughts for a moment. Regardless, with the amulet in my pocket, it was time to pick my class and leave. Although, not before Boris makes the dumbest assumption ever by somehow believing I'm an archer. While the ability to fire my hands off like rockets and attack people from range would be incredible, sadly that is not a feature, so I just create a rather standard class for this particular build. Just in case anyone is wondering, I am going with light over heavy armour, simply because I like the idea of retaining some speed while fighting, as dodging attacks is a lot better than trying to block a sword with your fist. First things first, after becoming a free cat I head across the river to make short work of the nearby bandits. Not only because I am bloodthirsty, but they have a nearby skill book that just so happens to increase my hand to hand skill. Before I even think about tackling the main story and walking straight into hell, I need to better equip myself. So it was off to the marketplace to sell all the useless items I found in the sewers. I spent most of it on healing potions and repair hammers if you're curious, before heading to the arena. While I do plan to fight in the arena, as it's a great way to both increase skills and get gold early on, I first make a quick detour to steal the bands of Quang Lao from a nearby chest, as while they're equipped, I get an extra 20 points to hand to hand. I then stand around for a moment and creepily watch the folks I just stole from, so that I may get another 5 points to my punching prowess, which allows me to level up and increase my strength, that combined with my 69 hand to hand, now lets my fists do 5 points of damage with each swing. While that still sounds absolutely horrible, let's keep in mind that hand-to-hand -hand combat is very fast in Oblivion, so despite the fact the base damage seems quite low, the amount of strikes I can get out in a short period of time allows the damage to build up quite quick. This is no more apparent than just how easy it is for me to win fights in the arena. Something I also haven't mentioned is that your fists drain your opponent's fatigue as well as their health, so that can lead to situations like this, where they kind of just collapse in on themselves while I wheel away on them. I managed to get my skill to 50 here, meaning I now have the chance to disarm people with a sidestep power attack. Making sure I get the absolute most out of my fists is of course my primary concern for the time being, so with a few wins under my belt I headed for Skingrad as the blacksmith there sells a special helmet that can increase my hand to hand. 
The helmet in question is the Helmet Ferocity, and I am nowhere even close to being able to afford it, as it is currently sitting at a ridiculous 10,600 gold, whereas I currently only have just over a thousand. Putting the arena on hold for now, as I know for a fact I won't get anywhere near close enough to that amount of money, I figure I can make a start in the main quest. First is handing Joffrey the Chaos Emerald, and then it's down to Kavach, where after watching the sky crack open like an egg, I offer my assistance to the town's guard captain, and he politely tells me to go to hell. Literally. If I have learned anything from my time playing the Doom series, it's that demons and their spawn are rather squishy when it comes to being punched in the head. Sure enough, the same is true here. Granted, I am level 2, so all I have to contend with are stunted scamps and the odd Dremor, whose armour may as well be made from hopes and dreams. Not pretending like they still don't hurt me, it's just that using the wait function after every combat encounter here was more than enough to get past every fight, as waiting heals you back up to full health. Some of the Dremor began to give me the runaround as I ascended the tower, this one especially was just not having it and decided to just book it away from me as fast as he could. Sadly for him, I am rather persistent when it comes to hunting down people who don't want to fight, just watch one of my many massacres in New Vegas if you want some proof. Anyway, the last couple of enemies guarding the Sigil Stone were of no trouble. I was even fortunate enough to get some assistance as one of the mages blasted his buddy in the back, softening him up for the kill. I thanked him with some blunt force trauma and then grabbed the Sigil Stone. I will not be safe scumming the stones by the way in hopes of getting a worthwhile enchantment, instead I will just take what I get on my first go. For anyone curious, this one is for frost resistance on armour or frost damage on a weapon, so nothing exciting unfortunately. Reporting my success to the captain and it's time to save the city. To spice things up a bit, the Daedra now have access to xenomorphs that have been crossed with triceratopses, and just like the xenomorphs, standing too close to them when they take damage also hurts you, as I'm guessing they also have acid blood. Usually you would just counteract this by using magic or a bow, but despite Boris's intentions earlier, I will not be using those. For now, it's nothing I can't handle thanks to some healing potions as well as the small army that is currently at my beck and call. I then pay my respects to Saint Jib for all the times he greeted me in Morrowind before continuing into the chapel to drop the big bombshell on Martin. With Martin convinced to tag along, I can by all rights just leave Kvach now and press on with the main story, but I figured that while I'm here, I may as well help for the skill gains of nothing else. There isn't much point going over the rest of Kvatch's segment in detail, as with Martin by my side, along with the entire guard company and some Imperial Legion soldiers, we were able to swiftly cut a path through the last of the Daedra. Martin's that guy who says he'll play healer but ends up getting bored and transitions into a DPS class instead. With many a dead monster in our wake, we make our way to the corpse of the Count, steal his ring, and then return to Mattias for the literal clothes off his back. I joke about him giving me his armour, but to be honest I am going to wear it when I can, as it increases strength and therefore lets me punch just a little bit harder. Following more of the story, it's back to Wayne and Priory to beat up more of the Mythic Dawn. Unlike before in the sewers though, I am much stronger and can kill them with ease. Because the game needs to last more than two hours, the magic MacGuffin has been stolen, so now it's off to Cloudy Temple to save by protecting Martin and furthering the plot. My next task is to meet up with Boris once again, this time in the Imperial City. But before that, I got carried away and end up fighting the entire way through the arena questline. It wasn't really for the money or the experience. As you can see from the footage, I was just having dumb fun and enjoying the game. Don't get it twisted, that's not me just saying it was a cakewalk, far from it. Some of the fights, especially the one against the Argonian fighting triplets, were not only a drain on my healing supplies, but also resulted in my death on more than one occasion. I was able to learn how to fight more efficiently against stronger opponents though. Slowly circling them on their left side or towards their shield arm would usually let me unleash a seemingly never ending barrage of punches as they would rarely snap round to block the attack. This technique worked all the way to the end by the way, even against the handicap match against the yellow team's champion. However, I'm not going to take the glory for that one, as it was in fact Porkchop who delivered the killing blow. So by all rights he is technically the next champion, and clearly he was quite excited by that idea. If you are wondering how the fight against the Grey Prince went, well here it is. have zero shame making the same Metal Gear joke in two of my videos. I promise I will get to that series soon, or at least before the end of the year. With all of my winnings and a hype man at my disposal, I fast travelled to Bruma and spent it all on hand to hand training. Can't say for certain if that was the best use of it, but at the time it seemed like a good call. I followed this by levelling up, which also got the attention of Lucian, who I just decided would be an effective punching bag before stealing his robes and cremating him. 
After all of this, my hand to hand was sitting at a base of 74, and at a skill of 94 when wearing the bands. I now do 7 damage with each punch, so progress has definitely been made to say the least. Back on the story side of things, I find Boris at one of the many inns where he informs me that he's being tailed by a Mythic Dawn assassin, who is sitting approximately 3 feet away, so it's a good thing he doesn't hear this conversation. After Boris leaves and the assassin follows him, I join onto the end of the conga line where we resolve the situation with violence because no one uses his speech skill. On the body of the bloodstained man we find one of four Mythic Dawn commentaries, and now it's time for the mandatory Bethesda fast travel talk quest. You've seen this before in Fallout and Skyrim, it's where you spend 90% of the quest just walking back and forward between various people learning nuggets of information while being led on a goose chase. It culminates with me threatening the fun-sized elf that he'll be an accomplice to the Emperor's death before he hands me the book and me and Johnson make our way back down into the Imperial sewers because I guess the two of us just like to bond down here. The adoring fan, for once in his life, did something useful and helped light the way with his torch while me and Boris got to work playing Exterminator. When the time came to meet the sponsor for the Mythic Dawn, I insisted that I be the one to do the talking. Clearly that was a lie, as by talk I really just meant I was going to ram my big furry hand down Cameron Jr's throat where I received the final commentary. Luckily enough, the book wasn't the only important item he had, as I was able to take his base ring of retribution, which reflected 8% of all damage, back on my attacker. Considering my fists are eventually going to cap on the damage they do outside of strength enchantments, this was quite a great find even if it's only 8%. With the four books in my possession, I return to Tarmina so I can touch the glowing red map, which will conveniently point me towards the Mythic Dawn's secret base. Rather than head there straight away, I instead made a detour to Vin Diesel, as just inside here is where you can find Ombra, both the person and the sword. The reason I am here is because very shortly, Martin will require a Daedric artifact for the ritual to open the portal to Mike Cameron's paradise, and it just so happens that the quest with Ombra is glitched, as normally you need to be level 20 to start the quest, but if you kill her here and take the sword, you can complete the quest at any level. Things are off to a bad start as the adoring fan does an oopsie and gets himself impaled to death by the way of a spike trap. Tragic, but not surprising. Turns out there's a reason the game wants you to be level 20 before attempting this, and it's because she has a lot of health, and she hits incredibly hard, as Umber is one of, if not, the best weapon in the game. After many, many failed attempts, either directly by her, or by stumbling into a trap while trying to get her to fall in, I just decided that this wouldn't be worth the hassle, and instead made my way for the secret dawn hideout. Normally, you just sneak in here under cover, as they believe you're a new recruit. But after that whole Umber fiasco, I wanted to prove that I was still strong, and as such, I made it my mission to fight my way through the entire base. This was actually a lot easier than I expected. Their robes don't offer a lot of protection, and I believe they are weaker anyway, as the game throws a lot of them at you here. Well, a lot by Oblivion standards anyway. The highlight of this was that I was able to get a single dig into Cameron before he teleported out. I don't know why, but that made me feel great. I also beat up a statue of their god for reasons I can't comprehend. After grabbing another book and becoming a walking library, I return to Martin, and he screams at me for doing a good job. The next mission, Spies, is kind of like the reverse of the last quest, as now I have to find undercover Mythic Dawn agents outside of Bruma. It's a short and simple quest as you just have to wait for them by the runestone near Cloud Roller Temple before breaking into one of their houses and reporting the information back to Joffrey. Something that took me by surprise though was whenever I was fighting the second spy, I hit her with one of the hand-to-hand -hand block counters, but for whatever reason, doing so propelled me forward at a high speed and covered a sizable distance. If it was any other game series, I'd be asking you all what just happened, but this being the Bethesda game, I think we all know just to accept these kinds of things as features by this stage. After the quest was done, I had to make a journey to the Imperial City, as I needed my bands repaired and I currently don't have a high enough skill to repair magic items myself. Usually I leave this stuff out of the video, but as I arrived I was assaulted by Mythic Dawn assassins. That's nothing out of the ordinary though. The best part about this was I didn't even have to lift a finger because my Khajiit brothers came to my rescue and brutally murdered him in the street. Good to know I have a gang in the city willing to help me at a moment's notice. After I repaired the bands it was now time to get that artifact I mentioned, and I just ended up going with the Azura quest the game points you to. Basically she just wants me to kill some of her former followers who are now vampires. It sounds simple on paper, and honestly with an actual weapon it would be, but as it stands these vampires can pack quite a punch, as one of them killed me so fast I didn't even get to watch my body ragdoll and instead it threw me right back to the load screen. It took a few attempts, but eventually I figured playing it slow was the way to go, as I would try to lure them out one at a time, as in one-on-one -on -one encounters I can usually come out on top with no trouble. Then, after they were dead, I would leave the cave and wait an hour to regen my health, and then rinse and repeat until the cave was cleared. The last orc proved rather difficult and ended up costing me most of my potions, so I would need to restock after this as well, which was concerning, as money was dangerously low. 
On the bright side, not only was I victorious, but the adoring fan somehow managed to claw his way back from the depths of hell so that he could serve me once more. So that's nice. Taking the star back to Martin ends the quest, and now it's time for the second of three mandatory Oblivion Gates for the main story. After briefly discussing the situation with Bird, I rush straight into the Oblivion Gate and get into a fist fight with some of the Flame Atronax. While their flames hurt me, the support from Bird and his men is much appreciated as we can get past them with little issue. Rather than fight my way down the long path that leads to the tower with the stone, I instead opted to jump from the broken bridge into the lava and tank my way through the damage to the other side. Thankfully, I know that this works as it's how I always do this gate. The only issue is that now I'm all alone to face the Daedra in the tower as Bird is back dealing with everyone outside. It's not as bad as it sounds if I'm being honest, as rarely do they actually gang up on me, and therefore it's a rather comfortable journey all the way to the top. I even got lucky enough to get another magic ring that allows me to resist a decent amount of magic damage. And as there is no way to outright block spells with my hands, this is a much welcome addition to my gear. Sadly though, things aren't as smooth sailing as I had initially thought, as when I got to the sigil stone, the game wouldn't actually let me grab the thing because Bird wasn't in the same room as me. I figured that just waiting around would solve the issue like usual, but for some reason, he never appeared. Confused and mildly concerned, I made my way back down the tar and outside, where I discovered that Bird was in the lava just outside the tar. Or at least, that's what the compass initially told me. After he fell unconscious, the marker jumped to a different part of the area, and upon following it, I found that he was miles out into the sea of lava, and every time the game showed me the Bird's unconscious prompt, he got further and further away. I spent a while pondering what exactly to do while killing the last of the Daedra, until eventually I left and re-entered, which thankfully brought Bird back to solid ground. Determined to make sure he wouldn't wander off again, I made sure to take the long way to the tower and never got too far ahead of him. As tedious as it was to run back and forward this many times, at the very least all the enemies were dead, so getting Bird to the stone was rather straightforward. Wouldn't you know it, the sigil stone from the gate was another resist magic enchantment, so I immediately used it on an amulet I was carrying, and now I can have a total of 21% magic resistance, which isn't too bad. With another gate behind me, I returned to Martin, and now it was off to Sanctator to fetch the armor of Tiber Septum, or more specifically, little bits of his blood that are left on the armor. If you recall the last time I was here in my other Oblivion video, then you will remember that I spent nearly an hour here trying to deal with the skeletons of the Blade Soldiers, as I had to get the ghosts to kill them with friendly fire. With that in mind, I can't even begin to describe how cathartic it was to just be able to walk up here and start beating all these skeletons. My go-to strategy for dealing with them was to just disarm them and then overwhelm them with an onslaught of punches. It's not a very complex plan, but as you can see, it gets results. The very first skeleton even got so scared when I knocked away his weapon that he started to flee from me. I wasn't even aware that skeletons could flee in Oblivion if I'm being honest. After a few more brutal bone bashing beatdowns, I can make my way to the central chamber and collect the armour. Throughout all of this, I have been picking up just about every semi-valuable object I could find and selling them for money so that I could afford more training. Sure enough, this eventually paid off as I was able to max out my hand-to-hand -hand skill and due to all the skill upgrades, could actually reach level 12. My punches now do 10 points of damage with each swing, and I feel that's about as strong as they're going to get for this run, all things considered. It isn't awful, but when compared to the damage output of most other weapons when you have maxed out their respective skills, it's not all that impressive. Yet again, it's back to Martin, and he gives me another fetch quest to partake in. I would like to point out that while this is going on, I do have the Aid for Bruma quest, but other than enlisting the help of the surviving Kavach soldiers, I'm not going to bother with any of the other cities, as all it does is replace the Bruma militia with one or two soldiers from each town, and from my own experience, the militia do just fine during the defence. Back to the fetching of the glowing objects, and this time I must trek through the alien ruin of Miss Cargand to find the Great Wilkinstone. Of course, it's never that simple, as the place is infested with zombies and goblins. That said, they seem to be more interested in killing each other, so other than a few brawls here and there, I can mostly just ignore them. To make up for the lack of bloody knuckles on my end, I do make sure to fight the king after grabbing the stone. He is nothing out of the ordinary, just your run-of-the-mill lich as far as I can tell. The only difficult part is the sheer amount of backup he has in the form of various zombies. To circumvent this, I just run in circles around the stairs in the area as to confuse them while I stop to get a few hits in on their leader. After about a minute or so of doing this, the king gets dethroned, and now it's time for me to backtrack the way I just came. This all then leads to the defense of Bruma, where after some talking in the church, we make our stand against a seemingly never-ending wave of Daedra. Also, if you are curious, Kavach sent a single, nameless soldier to help, even after everything I did for them. The actual defense itself, while waiting for the great gate to open, is as always so unbelievably easy as no matter the skill of your allies, they always just seem to rush every enemy group as they appear, so from my experience, there's never really a situation where you'll be outnumbered. When the big gate finally spawns, I make a mad dash for it, and just like I expected, the adoring fan was waiting for me on the other side, perhaps he is in fact the Daedra's secret weapon. 
what with his ability to blend into society and mentally destroy even the strongest of heroes. No time to wonder about those conspiracies, as this quest has a time limit, and seeing how my fists aren't the fastest killers, I really do just decide to skip most of the encounters here. It's not too tough, I just have to be wary of the occasional fire or lightning bolt, as by this stage I am faster than most of the Dremor. After grabbing the giant orb, I am thrust back to Tamriel, where I discover the unfortunate fate of Joffrey. It seems like he stabbed himself, so that's not good. Well, with the gate closed, it's on to the final stretch, so I make a point to go shopping one final time for healing supplies before making my way to Cameron's Paradise. The first person I come into contact with is the Dremora. I'm aware that I can help him with a small task and proceed that way, but, I mean, I didn't spend all this time honing my fighting skills just to pass up on a 1v1. He is no more difficult than your average Demora, however, he also physically attacks the player as the lingering flames from each of his sword strikes makes it very difficult to see in the first person. In retrospect, I should have just tried to disarm him, but for some reason, the thought never crossed my mind. Anyway, after grabbing the bands of the Chosen, I proceed to the next area, where I somehow win a fist fight against the Daedroth, yet in the very next room struggle to fight off a few clan fears as I get repeatedly stun blocked to hell and back. I also had a few slip ups here as I kept losing my footing and landing in the lava pools down below. On the bright side, I was able to gain the assistance of Eldamil, who immediately showed his worth as the two of us killed Cameron's children yet again. Obviously, they can respawn indefinitely, but taking them out here allows me to rush into Minecar Cameron's throne room and get a considerable amount of damage in before they can return to back him up. This probably would have been a difficult fight if it wasn't for the whole 21% magic resistance I've got going on, as his spells, while strong, were nothing I couldn't heal through with the last of my potions. Before long, I take out Truth, steal his clothes, and then get paralysed while trying to sit on his chair. I then plop back into the real world like a plank of wood before escorting Martin to the end of the game. Not to be anticlimactic, but the final quest is really more of an epilogue as you literally just walk into the next area over to finish the game. That said, I did try to fight Dagon one on one, which went about as well as you might think. After that attempt, I tag in Martin, he uses his signature move Spicy Dragon to take a bite out of crime, sending Dagon back to the Elder Scrolls IV Oblivion, finishing the game, and proving yes, you can indeed beat Oblivion with only your fists. As I said at the beginning, I had a feeling this was entirely possible for me, but I really just wanted to play Oblivion, and while I may not get to reply to all your comments, just know I have seen the request for more Oblivion runs, so I hope this was worth the wait. Regardless, that's going to be in this challenge video. If you enjoyed this talk, consider giving the video a like. If you're interested in more challenging in the future, feel free to subscribe to one of the videos out every week. My name is Nerbert684, and I'll see you all in the next video.